<laughs> okay. Um, I think we are very happy to see you, sir. And I'm going to start off with just one little word of congratulations because today um, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences announced the shortlist for the eligible feature length documentaries. There were 142 or so, now it's down to 15. Among those 15, where to invade next? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. As it should be. Well, so, you travel a lot in Where to Invade Next, and you actually managed to satirize the United States without shooting a single scene in our country. And you do include archival footage, but was there ever a thought on your part to shoot something in the United States, or was it intentional to only use the foreign footage to illuminate our culture? It, it was intentional be only because after 25 years of doing this, uh, you, you have to sort of uh, kind of change it up just for yourself to keep it interesting or exciting or try something different. And I said to the crew, I said, what, what, what do you think of, what, how about if we made a movie about all the things that are wrong in this country, but we don't shoot a single frame in this country. And they're like, what are you talking about? I said, well, what if we just showed that there are these other countries that are, have actually found ways to solve these problems, and we just show that, and then throughout the movie, the audience just has this sick feeling in their gut. <laughs> <laughs> like, you mean this can actually happen? <laughs> And, uh, but, but we honest, to be honest, we thought we would have to come back here and, and do some of that because we just can't, you know, resist. There's so much going on and whatever. And, uh, and, uh, but we decided to stick to our, our original idea, uh, to not shoot in this, in this country. And, um, and I was really happy that, that we did that. And I, I'm, you know, I have such an incredible crew. The people that made this film with me worked with me, a couple of them worked on Roger and Me um, all those years ago. There's a couple from Bowling for Columbine. There's a couple that worked on Fahrenheit 9-11. There's a couple that worked on Sicko. So we sort of kind of brought the band back together of like all my favorite people that worked on all these films and, and, uh, and made this. Uh, so it was a lot of fun doing it and we hoped that we were doing something that would get a conversation going. Uh, and, and a sense of hope, not false hope, but real, you know, like what if, what if a bunch of cynics made a hopeful film, you know, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> so so we're all, we all really are optimists at heart. Because sure. we, we believe that, that anything is possible in this country. One of those cliches about the United States, I think that's very true, that, that we really we can do, we really can do anything and we can cho choose to do it for good or for, or for evil. And I prefer the good that we've done and I think we can do more of it, so. I, I think after seeing this film, I agree even more than I might have before. This is a film that is written, directed, and produced by Michael Moore, which leads to the question for me of how much was actually scripted. In other words, was there for you at the beginning some sort of written blueprint where you already knew that it would be, you know, Italy and then France, or was it a process of discovery first that then led you mm. to write something? Well, that's a good question. First of all, it, it says written, produced, and directed by Michael Moore only because I, I don't believe that your name should be on more than one card. <laughs> I, I do these movies, it's like there's a separate card written by Michael Moore, and then it says produced by Michael Moore, directed by Michael Moore, starring Michael Moore. It just, uh, it's, there's something in my upbringing that probably couldn't allow anything like that to happen. But I, uh, to answer your question, um, no, we are probably the, the least scripted of what, of what most documentaries you would see because I, um, I find it much more exhilarating to go into something not knowing what's going to happen. I realize that I take my own ideas and prejudices with me into it. But oftentimes in the middle of the film, I realize that I'm wrong or I don't have it quite right. I remember in Bowling for Columbine, 
that started out with, well, if we just had stronger gun laws, you know, that would fix everything, or if we, there were less guns. And it does, it is true, if there are less guns, there obviously will be less gun crime and suicide and whatever. But um, we were in Canada shooting and we went to the office, so it's called Canada Statistics in Ottawa. That's their capital. And, um, and they, uh, <laughs> sorry, I don't know. I just, <laughs> in, in my show, I have, a, a, there's a, within the show, a game show called Stump the Yank. And, and I, I, I bring up, I ask for the smartest American in the audience, and hopefully Ivy League, hopefully a 4.0, bring them up here. And then, and then I ask for like the dumbest Canadian in the audience. And there's, there's always Canadians, believe me. Are there any Canadians in here tonight? Anybody that grew up in Canada? One, two, anybody else? They're so polite, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> But usually I try to get somebody that's got like a C or a, a below average, you know, grade. And then I test my theory that I believe that the dumbest Canadian is smarter than the smartest American. <laughs> and, um, and so I would used to ask the, I'd ask the Canadian, I, I, I did a five week run of this in London, and, uh, and I asked the Canadian, who's the president of the United States? Well, of course, every Canadian knows that. Then I'd say to the American, who's the president of Canada? Which is a trick question, because they, they don't have a president. And so, then it's like, oh, the buzzer would go, eh, no, they have a prime minister. Okay, who's the prime minister? And nobody, nobody knows the prime minister of Canada. Except now that it's a Trudeau again, I gotta take this out of my, out of my, uh, my play because I think most of the audience is gonna, has heard that it's a Trudeau. And it, Maybe ask for the first name. Ask for the first name, right? <laughs> yes, that, that, would, that would do, but. Uh, Anyways, the, I would, the, you know, the, the Canadian, the American would never know the name of the Prime Minister of Canada, and, and it would be usually an educated audience, just like if I, I assume this, this looks like a mostly educated, no, I wasn't going to, I was going to ask you who the President of Mexico is. Waiting. <laughs> you know, and I'm sure most of these people have a, a good degree and read three papers a day, but... That's who we are. I mean, I'm, I'm not, don't ask me who it is. I don't know who it is. So I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm just saying we, we th I think that's why people in other countries kind of like us in a way. They like us as people. They don't like how we structure ourselves as a government, but they do like us as people. And, and I think that part of that is just because we're so, hey, hi, Annette. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, like a Brit and a German, they're all very, the cards are very close to the chest, you know. And, uh, yes, hello. <laughs> and, but we're like, hey, hey, how's it going? How you feeling? You know, and, and we're kind of cute like that, don't you think? Um, <laughs> you make me remember Kieślowski. He was this great Polish filmmaker about whom I wrote a book. And he told me that every time he went to LA, he was stunned by, everyone goes, hey, how are you doing? And everybody would answer, fantastic, great. So he would always answer, I'm so-so. And that was, the, <laughs> that was the title of the documentary that was made about him, I'm so-so. Because for, for Polish people, for example, the right. extremes of our uh, uh, Pollyanna-like attitudes, you know, is, is kind of ludicrous. Plus, if you know, if you've been to Poland or you know any Polish, to say, I'm so-so, that's huge. <laughs> I'm so-so, that's like a good day in Poland. <laughs> you know, so it's like, it's like. <laughs> Where to invade next part two begins in Warsaw. Yes. Okay. So but to answer your question, yes, I, we don't, we don't script. I have a basic idea. I have a basic uh, list of say countries I'd like to go to, but we'll go over there and then all of a sudden one day I'll, I'll just, you know, we should go to Estonia. And you know, this is, I drive the producers crazy with these ideas. And then literally three hours later we're on a ferry to Estonia that we weren't planning to go to at all. And on the ferry we're trying to call ahead to get the interviews we need, but, the, because, but we're on the, the nine o'clock ferry that gets in at midnight and we are on a seven o'clock, we're on an eight o'clock plane out of Helsinki to Iceland, so we need to do the interviews between midnight and 4 a.m. in Estonia. Uh, th this didn't make it into the film, but 
it was really a wonderful scene. The only reason it's not in the film is I, I'm a big believer that movies are too long. And, uh, and I, I like movies that are under two hours. And, and I think that if your movie is going to be longer than two hours, there should be a system set up where you get special dispensation. You know, like if you're Lawrence of Arabia or whatever, you have to go to like a board like, like Annette Insdorf is the chair of, and, and they will decide whether or not this movie can be longer than two hours. But, <laughs> but basically, so we took the ferry to, I wanted to go there because I saw this statistic from the United Nations. And it said, World Health Organization, that uh, women have the, 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 have the lowest uh, maternal mortality rate in Estonia than any other country. In other words, mothers who die in childbirth, that you have a, the least likely chance of that happening if you are an Estonian. Then you have a three times more likely chance of dying in childbirth as a mother in the United States than, than, than in Estonia. And I thought, how did a former Soviet Republic get to the point of, of this? And I thought that was very interesting. And I just said to the crew, you know, there is a ferry here from Helsinki. We could get on it. You know, we just could show up at a hospital. And we shot this great scene where the doctor in the maternity ward took us around. And we're walking down this hall. And there's a picture of Hillary Clinton in the hallway of like a Hillary Clinton of 20 years ago when she was first lady. And I said, who is she with? He goes, that's me. It was him 20 years ago, the doctor. And I said, well, what was she doing here in Estonia? And he, he said, she was studying our healthcare system because we were already doing so well with this particular issue of both infant and maternal mortality. And, and, uh, and she was so happy with everything she learned here from us. And she had Johns Hopkins or somebody send us an MRI machine that we didn't have when she got back to the US. And, and I looked at that picture, and I filmed him looking at the picture. And I'll, maybe I'll, I'll release this on the internet or something, because it's such a moving scene. And those of us who were Americans were staying. It's 3 in the morning in this hospital hallway looking at a, a, a young Hillary Clinton. Um, so this would be like 93, 94. She's getting the crap beat out of her because she wants every American to have health care, health insurance. And those of you old enough, right, to remember the abuse that she took. And she was right then, 20 plus years ago. And just looking at that, and, and one of the producers said, because we had done research on this for Sicko, said, you remember that from the Congressional Budget Office, the number of Americans they estimate die each year, be, either because they don't have health insurance or they have lousy health insurance that won't pay for the treatment that they really need. And it was 49,000 Americans each year die as a result of bad or no health insurance. And, and we did like a quick, you know, those of us who had Catholic school education did a quick calculation in the, our heads. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was like, but I'm, I'm laughing because it was so sad. We, it was like a million Americans died because Hillary was the devil. A million, in Amer a million Americans over 20 years died for no other reason than that they, they didn't have the health insurance that someone in France or Britain or Estonia had, simply because they were an American. They, that's really should be the list of cause of death on the death certificate. They were an American. Because if they were Canadian or anybody else. Yeah. So it was, just, it, was just, it was just one of those moments. And I, and I say that not as an endorsement of, of, of Hillary. I haven't endorsed anybody. I, I just, you know, uh, obviously I like her for a lot of reasons, and of course Bernie's politics line up with mine probably a lot better. But, but uh, it was just one of those moments. But those moments happen because we don't script our movies, and 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 the research that is done, I tell the producers not to tell me most of anything. Like I want to hear it first from the people, and so because I want. I've always seen my role really as a stand-in for you on the screen. There's no reason on earth I would ever want to see myself blown up 50 feet <laughs> on a movie screen. Is anybody with me on this, please? <laughs> if, you, if you've ever said these words, I don't like my picture being taken, you know what I'm saying. And, and so, I'm, <coughs> so I put myself up there as your stand-in so you can cathartically live through me 
So if I'm busting through the doors of the CEO of General Motors, you can come with me via cinema. And, and, and so when I hear something the first time, the look on my face, the reaction I have, whatever, I, I want it to be what I think yours will be the first time you hear it. So I'll just give you a small example. When she says, uh, our honeymoon is paid for, you know, it's the law. <laughs> The sort of, you know, what the f look on my face. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't drop the F-bomb in here because I feel like I'm in sort of a religious institution. <laughs> but, but that look is real. If, if my producers had told me that, if I'd gone into that interview in advance knowing that those were the facts, then I go, oh, <laughs> there would be yeah. some bad acting going on. And so I'm learning a lot for the first time the way you're learning it for the first time when you're hearing this stuff, that nobody's been arrested in 15 years for drugs in, in Portugal. I mean, you've got to be freaking kidding me. So, um, so anyway, speaking of this, can I just say this fine institution? Sure. I, we were just talking backstage. Today is Woody Allen's 80th birthday. And um, <laughs> it's... Uh, I, I never had a chance to meet him until I came to one of Annette's screenings a couple of years ago, and he was sitting right over here, and I got up the courage to go down and introduce myself to him, <laughs> and it was just the most wonderful moment uh, uh, because of, you know, just growing up in Flint, Michigan, and I had my own little art house cinema there when I was in my 20s, and, and you know, every Friday and Saturday night it would be open, and, and literally, you could only see a Woody Allen film in Flint if I brought it to this theater. So, it was it was just uh, it was it was one. It's it's wonderful. It was wonderful at that moment, and it's been wonderful all these years to come here and see you interview directors on this stage. So thank you, <laughs> Annette Instor, for, uh, for that. <laughs> Uh, I appreciate it. And by the way, the, the film that night was The Artist. And it was um, the first public uh, presentation from Michel Hazanavicius, who had directed this silent French film, you know. And that was one of the times that I went with my gut. We didn't have a star to offer you. And I just felt, you got to discover this one. And then I find out Woody Allen's in the audience, Michael Moore's in the audience. And I'm going, oh. Okay, this suddenly got even better. Um, what you're describing, though, is fascinating for a couple of reasons. First of all, I'm curious how many other countries besides Estonia were either envisioned or even shot in that didn't make it into this. And the second part of that is, well, yeah, we don't want overlong documentaries in theaters, but now we have the DVD option, the director's cut, the new versions that can have as much as four or five hours. Might those end up in such a version? I, or I might use them <clears throat> in another film. Uh, some of the things in Norway here, I shot for Sicko and didn't put it in, it was 2007, and I didn't put it in there because I didn't think the American public would believe it, even though they're watching it. You know, I just thought there's no way they're gonna believe that they run their prison system like this. I also interviewed a, um, the, the government, you know, they own the oil, the, there's a government oil company, and then they lease the oil rights to Shell or Exxon or whatever, but they don't let Exxon or Shell own any of the natural resources that are theirs. So they have a state oil company, and one of the laws says that the state oil company must hire a philosopher. And the... the, the <laughs> See, I knew nobody would believe it. And, but, and the state, so the state oil company philosopher's job is to make sure that the state oil company does the right thing, does the right thing for the planet, for the people of Norway, for the, the, for the and just the larger sort of, you know, global thing that a philosopher would be thinking about. And, and he has a very important, he was a he then, it was a she later, uh, has a very important say as to how the oil is to be used and how the money from the oil is to be used and how the earth is to be treated. Wow. It's very cool. And, um, and I just want you to remember, these people were Vikings. They were, <laughs> they were amongst the most vicious killers in history. 
they, they, were, they were awful. So I'm just saying that, we, that things can get better <laughs> over a period of a thousand years. Actually, as long as we're on Norway, I have to ask this even though I, I think I know the answer. Was there really a video of Norwegian prison workers singing We Are the World? I know, this kills me. I get asked this all the time. Yes, <laughs> yes. I, I know, I think I have a decent enough sense of humor to come up with that idea. But <laughs> seriously, that would take a sense of humor and drugs <laughs> to sort of... And, and I don't do drugs, so I'm like, I'm, at, I'm limited in that way. I, but I said in the edit room, I said, People are going to think we did this as a joke. Yeah. Did anybody else think that that was maybe a, a possibly, possibly, right? Ay, ay, ay. It's, it's just, um, no. They, when they opened the prison, they decided to make this video as an orientation video wow. for new prisoners. And the warden's orientation talk that he has with each new prisoner is, we don't have the death penalty. We don't have life in prison. That means someday you're walking out of here and there's a possibility you could be my neighbor on my street. Therefore, I am highly incentivized for you to have a good life because I want you to be a good neighbor if it turns out to be that way. And their whole philosophy is driven with how can we make them good neighbors? And I know, it's just, it's insane. Uh. I mean, just getting used to the idea that prisons are for rehabilitation rather than revenge right. is a concept that I guess needs to be discussed more and not well, just we won't even people. admit it's revenge here that word doesn't get used you know you never even hear even a right-wing politician will rarely come on and say our prisons exist for us to get revenge you know it's like some of us we just have to, some of it we have to be honest with ourselves that as Americans we have a few things we need to fix and, and one of the biggest things we were discussing backstage is the we versus me. You know, we're all about, you know, me, 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 pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Now, you've got your problems, I got my problems. You take care of yourself, I'll take care of myself. And, and over there, and Canada, and half the third world, it's basically we're all in this boat together and we're gonna sink or swim together. And they see it in their own self-interest to have a safer society, a better society, it, to make sure that the, that the cracks that people could fall through are closed as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And they see that as something that is for the greater good. And they operate with the sense of we and, 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 and not me. And it's, it's amazing to witness. And it's not that they're better than us. They, 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 just, they're, they just believe they're gonna have a longer life, and they do, they have longer life expectancy than we do. They're, they're going to have less crime, less murder. You know, they're gonna have a lot less of the social problems by constructing their society under the concept of we. And, and that you're not alone. There's something there for you. If the shit hits the fan in your life, you don't have to hit the fan. We're gonna take the fan away. We're gonna put a guard over the fan. Something's gonna be there so that you have a chance. And they don't think that's a weak thing. They don't think that that's a, a you know, a, um, they don't have this, they, they, they have the attitude that that's actually a strong thing. And it's strong, it's a sense of strength to be able to forgive and, and to be able to believe in redemption and that people can be better and do well. And the, listening to the father of the child who was murdered, and he's not the only one. We had our, our pick of many of the parents who were willing to go on camera and say that they do not want the death penalty for this guy. They wanted him to have a fair trial. They, they want to show him that they're actually civilized. And we're going to behave in a civilized way. We're not going to, as he says, go down the rungs of the ladder to where you're at. We're going to stay right where we are. You're not going to change us. We're not going to change our laws. We're not going to take away rights. We're not going to take away freedoms. We're going to do actually more. So they, they, right now, they're in the process of trying to figure out how to give the lunatic groups more uh, of a say, not a say, but more of, so they don't feel that their voice is closed off, which then causes the insane ones to, I'm going to make a big statement, to give them the, the uh, to give them sort of the virtual Hyde Park 
soapbox, something to where they can just rave at, at the moon if they want. Um, but better to get it out that way than to shun them, uh, alienate them, and not give them the chance to have the, to say the things they have. They are also confident that they're not worried that if they spew racist, anti-Semitic uh, stuff, they feel strong enough that they've done their job with their children and their society that they, that they have such a shield against whatever that person would say. We're afraid of it in part, and, and I think the French would agree with this, and the Germans, they're afraid of it too, that because they know who they are, that if they let that go on, that could cause, it would inspire people to think that way. The, the Norwegians don't think that way, and it says much about them in terms of what they, how secure they feel in their own belief that we are the world. Mm -hmm. And that's why they would come up with a song like that. <laughs> and I'm curious, how do you inspire the trust of people that you're going to, in, to interview in their own home, in their factory, in their school, even the father. I mean, is it that m most of them know who you are and have seen your films? Do you have advanced people who, you know, check out and prepare? I mean, because everybody in this film seems really ready to welcome you into their confidence to share with you personal as well as professional things. And I, I'm, I'm curious how that comes about. Wow, that's a good question. Uh, I don't, wouldn't most of you take me home tonight? If we, I, would, I don't, I look like, I wouldn't do anything to your house, right? Or I would be a decent guest for an hour. We could go, right? And have a beer or some chocolate cookies or something. I don't know. I, I, I don't, I think that, I think that, I think that I, I, um, I don't know. I, I don't know. I think it's probably just me. I am myself. That person you see on the screen, I mean, is, well, I mean, you've seen me not, I mean, they're seeing me on a stage, but this really is me. Yeah, and you've yeah. seen me not on a stage. There's not a whole lot of no, difference, no, right? No. I don't know. I wouldn't know how to act. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was wearing these ball caps before I made any movies. I just didn't take it off. You know, it wasn't because I was bald or anything. I, you know, I got like... <laughs> hair, but I'm just, I, I don't know how to answer that question. Well, I, no, no, I, but I, the advanced people, you know, I do have field producers. In this movie, they were, like if you were the Italian field producer, you were three days ahead of me. And so you were looking for people that would talk to me, basically. And without telling them a whole lot about what I was going to ask them, because again, I wanted to be fresh. So they chose, for example, that Italian couple with the paid sometimes they Sometimes they'll say this, you're going to, they know, because they worked with me for 20 years, so they know. Or, like, let's go back to Roger and me. Uh, if you remember, there was a deputy sheriff who was evicting people throughout the film. And I had four deputy sheriffs to choose from. And, um, and he was first. I knew right away I wanted him, so I didn't bother with, with the other three. In Fahrenheit 9-11, there was a mother from Flint who lost her son in Iraq. And I spent a lot of time with her and traveling with her, but I also did that with another mother from Flint. But, but so I sort of, I make the choice essentially either there in the room uh, or, and I've gotten sort of at the point now where I know, I kind of know really quickly. So if we're in the wrong place, I'll wrap it up kind of nicely and quickly and, and we'll move on. And sometimes it's really just, it's just going into a restaurant or a store and I'll just see people that look interesting and I'll just say, why don't we go talk to them? And then we'll find out that they're a cop and this, she buys clothes or whatever. So it'll, it, it'll be a combination of all that. But I have really good field producers and they, they kind of know me by now to know, you know who was probably going to click with me. Sure. And that Italian couple was just so good. You know, it's just like, but, but, but uh, 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 Tierney found, uh, she found them in like two days. I mean, it wasn't a lot of, we didn't have a lot of prep on this film. It was, we did all the pre-production out of my living room here in the city. And uh, we decided not to spend a, a gazillions of dollars on this. Let's just do this kind of raw, the old way we did it, like in Roger and me, get the minivan, travel around, see what happens. And it was a lot of fun for us to go back to doing it the way that, we did it, and we didn't have all this other rigmarole. How long did it take? Uh, the, uh, the, um, it took, actually, um, <laughs> the, the producer isn't here tonight, so I can tell you the truth. Uh, <laughs> well, because she says to me, she says, 
you know, don't, don't because it's, it's hard to make a documentary, and it's hard for us. We usually take two or three years to make these films. Every documentary filmmaker will, will tell you that, sometimes longer. This took us four and a half months from the first day of shooting to the la end of the editing and starting the mix. I know, and we went to 12 countries. I know, I know, it's good. Okay, well, let's see, I wish she was here that you applauded because she said people are just gonna hate us. No, and I, no, and I, I, I just, my admiration just went up even more. Oh, oh wow. Because I'm amazed well, that, I mean, first of all, you're also leading me into my next question, which is about the editing process. I mean, it's obvious that you were well prepared and that you found extremely appropriate and articulate individuals and fruitful situations. But you obviously, in the editing process, created a structure that works. I know it's you know chronological, mm. Italy, France, whatever. How, but I think also there is a great art in the way that this film plays because your satiric thrust comes through not merely in your voiceover and in your persona. It's having, for example, after we see the montage of the wars that the US has lost since the 1950s, hearing the whistling from the bridge on the river, over the River Kwai. That's, for me, Michael Moore, quintessentially, you know? Um, and for example, it's in the tension when we hear Bush's rhetoric and seeing American footage um, of crimes at home, voter suppression, foreclosures. In other words, that's you. Did all of that come about primarily in the editing process? In other words, just tell us a little about how this was all shaped. Mm. The, uh, the opening was, was pretty much in my head from the, very, from the very beginning, just by calling the movie Where to Invade Next and, and not make it a question mark because we're Americans, like we already know where, what's next. <laughs> it's not a, it's not a que sadly, it's not a question. And, um, uh, it, ah, that's a great question. It, um, I should make a film about this because I think it's really interesting to watch how we pull this together. It, 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 uh, it, a lot of, some of it is, is like I have a strong idea of how it will begin. I have no idea how it will end. I don't want to know how it will end. Those of you who are writers, you know, there's the, the, the two basic ways we all talk about writing, whether it's a novel or a screenplay or whatever, you start and you let whatever the spirit is take you and you discover the end as you tell the story. Or you know the end and now you know everything you're going to write and do has to essentially lead to the conclusion that where you want to be at the end of this. So this is usually for me very much um, not knowing I had no idea that I would end at the Berlin Wall talking about how most of these ideas were initially American ideas. And because I didn't know that or think about it until we went to these countries. And country after country, people would say to me, why are you asking us this? <laughs> this was your idea. <laughs> you know, especially the Finns. They've studied all the kind of great American educators and philosophers of education and the progressive educators of this country, many of whose ideas have been discarded. And they will say, you had one of the greatest education systems in the world. Everybody in the world agreed on that. And then you decided to abandon your great education system. And none of us know why, but we just picked up, we just picked up what you threw away. You know, we're just doing a lot of what you initially thought of doing. Or the man, at the, the warden of the prison saying, it was your idea 200 years ago that there should be no cruel or unusual punishment. And that's what you do now. You have more prisoners than Russia and China combined. Uh, you, 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 you treat people, you shoot black kids in the street. You, you do, we don't understand it, but we decided to go by your old playbook. And we heard this over and over again. And by the end of the film, it was very powerful for us to think about how these things like the eight hour day and May Day is not a Soviet thing, but we grew up in the Cold War, so it was all the tanks and the missiles and whatever. And it was like, no, it was the Haymarket riot in Chicago in 1886 that, that it was American unions pushing the eight hour day of, of no child labor. These things were American ideas initiated by a German philosopher, Last name begins with an M. 
but, but taken up by American unions in the 1800s, or people were trying to start unions. And then the Europeans then copied us in a lot of what, a lot of what we did. That was, a, I would, if I was the kind of filmmaker who said, I've got to know my ending and I already know where I'm going to be and I know what I'm going to tell these people, what they got to learn, then I never would have had that ending or even the experience throughout of being reminded that we are a good people, that we have done good things and we are a smart and capable people and we have awful flaws that we don't want to recognize and if we would just acknowledge them like the Germans do, you know, if we would just say, yes, we are a nation that was founded in genocide and built on the backs of slaves. That's the truth. Now, what do we do with that? How can we move forward? You know, it's, but we still are wanting to fight this fight of, of not wanting to understand or recognize why African Americans maintain the lowest rung on the economic ladder. How could that be after all these years? It isn't just a coincidence. We don't want to face it. And my feeling was, especially when we were in Germany, I had no intention of putting the Nuremberg rally grounds in the film. I only went there because I often do this when we're making a movie. When we, whenever we shoot in DC, every time I always take the crew to the Vietnam Memorial and I show them the names of the nine guys from my high school that were killed in the war. And, and I take a few moments of silence to remember them. And, um, and in this case, I said, you know, we're in Nuremberg at this pencil factory, we have to go here to this awful, awful place and, and have a few moments of silence. And, um, and it, it, it really didn't hit me till later that I thought, well, this is where Lenny Riechenstahl, this is where we're on her set of Triumph of the Will, you know? And so my sort of sarcastic remark about, I used to make documentaries here, um, was like, well, why don't we, we're here, why don't we see what we can find out about what they, because I had heard that they teach the kids this, and boy, do they ever. I mean, we went to an elementary school, a middle school, a high school. This is, this is being drilled constantly, to the point where the Arabic kid, who's just Sad. become a German citizen, says that he must own the Holocaust. The Holocaust is his responsibility as a German because he now is a German citizen, so he bears a responsibility to redeem himself and Germany still for this. They don't have this attitude of, well, I'm 17 years old. I didn't do that. You know, I didn't own any slaves. You know, uh, I didn't make this a problem for the blacks. You know, I mean, they don't, they don't, I'm just, I was so moved by them on that level that they, their evil was just 70 years ago. This year, that's all that was. Slavery was 150 years ago. The genocide began hundreds of years ago. And, and we still are like, <laughs> this? It's, it's, it's so, it's, we worked really hard on this scene there in Germany because we really, I really want, I've been wanting to say this for some time about our original sin. I'm using a Catholic term here, but this sort of permanent mark that the church says is on your soul. And, and that Germany has this original sin. And we have, as a country, these original sins. And um, it, the editors were really, in, you know, um, one of the editors is black, one of the editors is Jewish. The pr producer I referenced earlier is a, a, a child of, uh, of survivors, as, as you are. And, um, and I said, you know, it's... <laughs> It's, I want to say some things in this film as a white person and as a Gentile. I want, I want African Americans to hear what I really think about these drug laws that were set up as really race laws. And that's how historians, that's how historians will say them. And, and to be honest, with documentary films, we don't see a lot of Holocaust documentaries made by Gentiles. And... Um, and I, wanna, I wanted to say something about that and that, that, that the, the lessons that need to be learned are lessons we can share here with, with our young people and that, and that we will be a better people when we do this. I, I just, I firmly, firmly believe this. And, um, and I know it's hard to think to say that the Germans are a better people, but, but 
you know, especially for our generation or older. I mean, my dad was in World War II, and, you know, it's, it's, it, we're raised with a certain, you know, I think, you know. I think you, you do it wonderfully when you show Germany threat, do, do we need to ask? I mean, it, it, it's, it's a subtle way of acknowledging that there is a lot in the past, but I think you earn the right to be called hopeful or optimistic because of your scenes in classrooms, in a lot of the segments of the film. I mean, for example, it may have been the quality of the cafeteria food in France that led you into that country, and that whole segment is wonderful, but it's the almost afterthought of sex education in the French classroom compared to abstinence in Texas that sort of suddenly it, it widens the frame. And in Germany, yeah, the pencil factory, I love the notion of the spa paid for for three weeks. And then all of a sudden, I'm in Nuremberg, and your scenes in the classroom maybe just need to be put into a little context. I think we all know that immediately after World War II in Germany, and it continued well into the late 1950s, yeah, there was the, collective amnesia. Yeah, I mean, 60s. nobody, yeah. nobody was talking about right. the Holocaust. In fact, the term didn't exist. Right. It took an NBC television serial to bring that word into the German vocabulary. But what you're showing is that people or governments and cultures can learn. That which was not addressed at a certain point in time can be addressed, and it has to start with education in the classrooms right. so that history is acknowledged, human desires are acknowledged, and somehow we move to a better place. And, and, and the 60s generation in Germany, they insisted that that be taught. They really, they really insisted that they, they did not like the fact that they were going through school and this wasn't being discussed. And out of that group came, came a whole German cinema and German filmmakers that were, that were going to be insistent that, that this be dealt with. And as you know, and because you've written about it and you've had people here, uh, that, it, that the arts became a very powerful way to educate, to remember, to remind, uh, and, and to redeem, hopefully. Um, the, the fact that the Germans are, have taken in 400,000 refugees, and they say they're going to take in another 400,000, and, and, and I'm no fan of Angela Merkel, but and she may lose her job as a result of this because some people are like, whoa. But she's like, no, that's who we are. That's who we are. And I'm thinking, who you are, you refuse to join with us in invading Iraq. We created this mess. We tore apart the political and religious infrastructure of that part of the, of the world. We created, we and the, and the drought in Syria, these are the two main reasons that there's this problem. And, and, and they're willing to clean up our mess for us. And we don't even, and we're like, we have 26 governors saying, can't come in our state. You know, we won't let you in our state. You know, it's like, wow. It, it's, and, and Tia, the, my producer, um, uh, I mean, she, she's not here, but she could tell you the story of basically her, it was her grandmother, her mother, and uh, were on a boat, one of those boats that God denied uh, they couldn't land in England. They came across the Atlantic. They, we wouldn't let them dock here. The Bahamas wouldn't let them dock. They went to every friggin' island in the Caribbean, and only Trinidad, only Trinidad let them dock and gave them Trinidad citizenship. And the only reason she's alive to produce this film is because the crazy people of Trinidad were willing to give them a, a passport so they could live. You know, I mean, I'm just, it's just like, <laughs> I'm like, I, I think that this, these stories have to be told, and I'm completely aware of the fact of how we benefit from the good that people do when they let refugees in. And, and, and yes, it's hard and all of that, but it's, it's uh, I'm going up against my own governor in Michigan. I don't know if you know about this. I, I, last week, I just I put on my, you, uh, you probably aren't on Twitter, so, and God bless Not. you. Don't ever go on Twitter. Um, <laughs> But no, I just, I, my governor in Michigan, Snyder, uh, said no Syrian refugees are going to be allowed in and they don't trust Obama and his vetting. And so basically, I have an apartment here in New York and I have an apartment in Michigan where I, where I live. And, um, and, I, and I said, um, uh, well, I'm going to defy this ban 
and I just put it out there that I am making my apartment available to Syrian refugees, and they, and I, I, I will, I, that for the next year, I, I mean, I will, I'll live here, which is, believe me, it's, it's not bad to live in New York. <laughs> Even though when I moved here, when I first moved here, you had a Republican governor, a Republican mayor. You still have a death penalty. Rush Limbaugh used to broadcast from here. Uh, the National Review is here. I mean, this is a very redneck, conservative, right-wing <laughs> town. And can I, not just to get off the subject, can I, has anybody seen the report today that Donald Trump trademarked the name Central Park? He owns, he, have you heard that? Please watch this, go online. To, this is the most, it's just in today's news. He trademarked in 1991, he's been, gra he grabbed up every Central Park trademark. He owns the name Central Park. The city of New York can't use Central Park anymore for to anything unless they get permission and pay him a license to, for, to use Central Park. He owns Central Park, the name. They've allowed this to happen, and, they, and there's a great investigative piece on this on how both the Bloomberg and Giuliani administrations, the, the city attorney said, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa we got to stop this. And they were like, nah, 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 let him, let him have it. So now he has it. it. It's just the craziest thing. I didn't mean to get off on that, but I just think I'm willing to live here for a full year. <laughs> so, so, and the, and the Syrian refugees uh, that, and, and so then I, People started writing in, and I got a beautiful note from Susan Sarandon that she'll give, she has an apartment in Chelsea that she'll turn over to Syria. So it's like, so I put on the internet, anybody that wants to sign up, I'm going to get this, I'm going to connect you with the State Department, we're going to get this going to provide, if you've got an empty apartment, a cottage, a cabin, whatever, that Syrian refugees can stay in. Uh, and I, as of today, I've got over 1,500 families willing to give their homes to Syrian refugees, but it's, I, I don't mean to get off the subject, but I just think that the lesson of Germany, I'm, I'm impacted by what I saw there. I'm impacted by them letting in 800,000 people that are not them. And, 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 my, and, and my attitude, and I don't mean to offend any Germans who are sitting in here, um, which I would love the irony of that, that you were here at the 92nd Street Y. Um, but... I, but I, but I, but I mean, come on, we're Americans. We're not Nazis, right? I mean, they did it. They did it. Come on. We're better than this. We're absolutely better than this. I know that. I know that for a fact. And I'm, I'm, and that's not some phony optimism. I really believe that we are capable to do a lot of what I've shown in this film. This is not rocket science to not feed kids poison at lunch. That is not rocket science. It is not rocket science to, 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 to say that college should not put you into $100,000 of debt. That is, and that is the big failure of us, of the baby boom generation, that we let that happen to our kids, that they've got to be saddled with that. Anybody who went to, I mean, University of Michigan was, I don't know, $500 a, a semester. I know what, wasn't CUNY free? I went to Queens College free. You went there free. Well, totally there you go. And so I, we, we knew how to do it before. You turned out okay. You know, <laughs> I just think that we can do better. Well, I, I know we can, but we need films like this to help us realize it. Um, we don't have a lot of time for questions, but I know that there are a few people here, including my students, who really wanted to ask one or two. So we'll take at least uh, five minutes of questions. Yes, right here. I'll give short answers so you can get more in. Okay. And I'll repeat. Like, although I'm for gun control, I didn't go to see Rolling for Columbine because I read about the scene with Charlton Heston. Now that Mr. Heston is dead, do you, do you ever wish you had treated him differently? Do I, the question do I, yeah. about Bowling for Columbine, um, which includes the scene with Charlton Heston, now that he has died, would Michael Moore, would you have done would you have treated him any differently in Bowling for Columbine, which is about gun control? I'm assuming you're asking this because you think that he had Alzheimer's when I interviewed him. Yeah, that's another sad, uh, this is why Fox News is so good at their propaganda. Um, I, I interviewed him two years before he went into early Alzheimer's. Uh, he did not have Alzheimer's uh, when I interviewed him in the film. Um, 
and he was the president of the NRA. And yes, I, I think I, I, I thought I treated him actually. Have you seen the movie? No. Oh, you should see it. I, I'm very. <laughs> no, seriously, I, I'll give you your money back if you don't like it. But I, 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 I treat him with a lot of respect. And I'm right. Anybody did you remember? I was very quiet, and 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 he he messed up. What happened was he had a Al Campanus moment. Uh, do you know what I mean by that, Jimmy the Greek? Uh, basically, he said something racial that it popped out, and he didn't obviously mean to say it, or at least say it on camera. And then he tried to walk it back, and it was it was hard, and so he left. He walked out on the interview. And I just asked him, I said, why do you think the Canadians, there's, I think the average was seven out of 10 Canadian homes have a gun, a hunting rifle, usually, not, a, not handguns. And, um, but hunting is the most popular sport in Canada, more popular than hockey. Why don't they kill each other at the rate that we kill each other? And he said, well, they don't have the same uh, ethnic makeup as we do. And, uh, and then he said, you know, this country, say what you want, but it was founded by a bunch of dead, old, wise white men. And, um, and then he heard himself, and he tried to catch it, and he couldn't, and he thought, I better end this, and so he walked out. So I, I yes, of course I would go, I would do the same interview the same way, and um, um, I'm glad it's in there. And people, liberals have to quit being wusses and being afraid to go after these people who have caused so much damage and harm and death in our society. So, but watch it, watch it. Check it out. Okay, I'll give shorter answers so you get more. No, 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 it's quite right. Yeah, because there's a lot of, I want to answer these questions. Okay. Well, Michael, thank you for coming. I hope it goes incredibly I hope the film gets shown in the red states as well as the 92nd Street. Why? Oh, it will, it will. Fahrenheit 9-11 on its opening weekend was the number one film in every red state in the box office. Seriously, it was the number one film. Was, and, and my films will play in shopping malls all across America. That's, that's why they go after me so much is because I don't just show my films in the church of the left. I, I, my films, you know, play Kansas and, uh, and they don't want my stuff being shown. Yeah, that's a great this question. Is a question about something that the film doesn't deal with directly, the, the fear, the threat of ISIS, ISIL, which is uh, the threat that exists, not just a fear that exists, not just in the United States, but around the world. Could you address that? Yeah, I think that's probably its own film, first of all. And I, I would certainly, if I, had, if, if I had, I would give that to my third clone to make that movie, uh, because it, I think that would be a very interesting film to make. I, the ISIL, ISIS, Dash, whatever, uh, have murdered, I think, four Americans so far. Four or five. The, the man at Planned Parenthood uh, was, has killed, killed one less than that. I'm much more frightened by the domestic terrorists in this country uh, than I am from, from the other side. And the main point, what I, what I said earlier about ISIS is, is that I think this is a monster that we helped to create. And um, I think the best thing for us, I don't have the answer to this, but, but I think we belong in the timeout room uh, because we don't know really how to defeat, as I said at the beginning of the movie, we lose these wars actually. Uh, it's best left to others to figure out the solution to this. And, and we haven't earned a seat at that table any longer. So let's try to keep our people safe. And, uh, but all that talk over Thanksgiving weekend of everybody worried about something happening. And uh, I went to a play in Times Square on Wednesday night and uh, it was half empty and I said to the, the manager said, what's, what's this, a fame, this is a popular play. He said, people are afraid to come to Times Square this weekend. I said, oh, jeez. Well, at that point, they win, first of all. All right. Uh, the French have shown us that. They don't, they don't allow them to win. They go right back out there. Um, and, uh, and we have to just quit being run by so much fear. And um, beyond that, I, but it would be a good film. Yeah. Yes, right here.
states, you know, as regards the Berlin Wall, that things could change so quickly. That's my fear with Trump. What are your thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if everybody heard, but given that you are a perennial optimist, as your footage of the Berlin Wall actually states, um, uh, what do you say about the possibility of Donald Trump in this context? Oh, I am here to be the bearer of some bad news uh, for you, I'm afraid. Uh, he will be the Republican candidate. I think we all know that by now. Yeah, 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 I know. I know, pinch yourself. It doesn't seem possible, right? Uh, yeah, he will not be your next president. There's the good news. Okay. So, I love, I love the way Stephen Colbert introduced him when he was on the show a couple months ago. He said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the last president of the United States, Donald Trump. Uh, <laughs> um, the implication, of course, being that, yes. Uh, no, here's the good news. Here's the good news. I want you to, when you leave here tonight, walk home with the statistic, all right? 81% of the people voting next year are either women, people of color, or young adults between the ages of 18 and 35. 81%. That's the American electorate. These Republicans, whoever they think they're talking to, it's that 19% it's that of angry white guys over the age of 35. And as an angry white guy over the age of 35, you know, I can tell you there's a, at least 30% of us are good. And, and, <laughs> and we're good for Hillary, we're good for Bernie, we're good for, you know, so, 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 that there, there's really no way to, well, there is one way to lose next year. And that would be, and you know what the way is, our side, we're the slacker side. We don't show up all the time. They are instructed by God to show up. <laughs> so, you know, you can't be God. I mean, seriously, we have nothing that's going to convince people more than that. So the job is to get out the vote. It's always about getting out the vote. But we have the votes. 81% is female, and women vote at a much higher percentage than men, and they vote, they vote for the Democrat now. They, they, it's been some elections now where the majority of women will vote for the Republican. They've cooked their goose with women, with people of color, with young people. Trump, I mean really, seriously, Trump. Imagine Trump winning. If 81% of the electorate is, is as I've described, all right, women, dames, broads, <laughs> right, people of color, Build a wall around them, right? And young people, ask your 19-year-old how cool they think Donald Trump is. <laughs> it ain't happening. So your job and my job really next year is really to go, wow, we're the majority. We're real America, not his America. We're actually the majority of Americans. Let's make sure we do our job and get the vote out there. And, and it's, 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 you know, we're pretty good. Any, any state that touches an ocean or a Great Lake, with the exception of South Carolina and Georgia, is a blue state. So, <laughs> and I'll think about that for a little bit. Uh, and then there's a couple landlocked places like, you know, Colorado and New Mexico, whatever. But generally, any, anybody who are their, their ancestors have traditionally had access to the world, they're a little more enlightened and not so ignorant. And... I'm just making this up, so I'm just, <laughs> but it's true though. It's a true fact. I'm giving you, a, if I say it's a fact, it's a fact. Um, oh, not the Gulf of Mexico. I said an ocean. Um, but, uh, but, <laughs> but it's, but seriously, that's it. 81%. That's the, that's the number to hold on to. We're in good shape. And I honestly believe whether it is either Bernie or Hillary, uh, that's why in the primary you should vote for who you think is the best because whoever has the D by their name is going to win and and Trump will crash and burn you actually kind of want him uh, as as the candidate in a way because but he will not implode enough times and he's on his seventh implosion <laughs> he won't implode enough times for the Republicans to shun him because they love that kind of, they, that's why they loved Reagan. Somebody will just say whatever is in his head, to hell with everybody else. He'll never back down. Um, but it's hard when you're in New York to want to trust your fellow Americans. And I tell you as one, as I come from a country they call the Midwest. <laughs> and 
it's not as bad as you think it is. It really isn't. It's just about getting out the vote. So, you know, want to do some of your students? Or? <laughs> well, the reality is that I, I we're at, we are actually... We're out of time. Can I just I say mean, one more thing then before absolutely. we... Absolutely. Okay, and I have one more thing to say. That, I, just, I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, 60 years ago today, Rosa Parks refused to give up... <laughs> oh, I didn't have to say I wanted to thank you. That's really all we need to say then, because it's, I've, I believe this should be a national holiday to honor all Americans who take a stand, all Americans who understand that we have no need for the word activist in this country. If you're a citizen of a democracy, that automatically implies you're an activist, because unless we're all active in the democracy, the democracy ceases to exist. So we're already all activists. And, and to honor her and honor people on this day and to acknowledge that one person can make a difference. On, at the Berlin Wall, that I was there the third night. There, there were maybe 40 people there. But on the first night, that first person had to take a hammer and chisel down there. You know, that first, that first person had to come out of the closet and, said, and say, I'm gay or I'm a lesbian. And, and, and as millions did it, it became harder to hate. And now we have, we have laws that are changing as a result of the courage that many individuals took. That woman in the, in the prologue or the, the epilogue of the film who climbs the pole to take the Confederate flag down. Sometimes it's just one person. In this case, person is a euphemism for woman. It takes one woman to climb that pole and take that thing down. And it's true for each and every one of you in here, it's true for me, you, and everybody, that, that our actions do count. They need us to believe that we have no power. What can one person do? How can you fight City Hall? Don't rock the boat. You just bang your head against the wall and you just get a concussion. That is exactly where they want us. But the truth is, and our history is, from Rosa Parks, before her and after her, that, that we are a better people because one person said enough, one person said I'm doing this, one person made that difference. It's not a cliche, it's actually an American truism and it's what makes this country great and it's what's gonna make us greater when we start to turn things around even more in this coming year. So thank you, thank you, Annette Inzor. Uh, no, thank you, I have nothing more to say, thank you. <laughs>